sir. If it has to be done, I'd rather do it. Timothy Dalton had attended the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art and quickly established himself in the industry as a strong Shakespearean actor. He performed with the Royal Shakespeare Company all over the world. Dalton first gained international attention in the award-winning film The Lion in Winter in 1969. He played opposite Catherine Hepburn, Anthony Hopkins, and Peter O'Toole, who had been the one to recommend Dalton for the role. Oh, by the way, you're better at this than I thought you'd be. I wasn't sure you'd notice. In 1969, Cubby Broccoli and Harry Saltzman approached Dalton to star in the upcoming Bond film On Her Majesty's Secret Service. He was in his early 20s at the time, and out of respect for the character, feeling he was too young to accurately play him, he turned the part down. He was subsequently offered the role four more times through the years. Now I have to stop and say there's always a lot of stories of all these actors being offered the role and considered for it or approached for it or whatever. I'm not entirely sure how accurate all this stuff is or how really serious the considerations were at the time. It seems like every actor with an accent and some without one were candidates for Bond through the years. But considering if this story is true, like, could you imagine that? It's hard to conceive an actor turning down the most coveted film role you could ask for, especially one who basically was just starting his film career. I mean, it's guaranteed to bring you wealth and fame and all that. I mean, if the story is true, you, you have to give the guy credit for it. Anyway, despite an auspicious start in films, Dalton returned to the theater. He mainly stayed a theater actor and stage producer for much of the 1970s. He showcased his Shakespearean talents in such films as Wuthering Heights, Mary Queen of Scots, and Cromwell. He would be very selective about his projects and was determined to make the very best out of each part he did. He gradually was making a name for himself in the industry. I'm sorry to say that despite all his impressive stage and film work, I mainly knew him from 1980's Flash Gordon. Bastard! I wasn't getting to the London Theatre much. Not like nowadays. During the end of Roger Moore's reign as Bond, when it was unclear whether he would return or not, Dalton's name was always on the list of possible replacements. When the passing of the torch to Brosnan fizzled and it was clear he wasn't going to be available, Dalton was called in. He auditioned, performing two scenes from On Her Majesty's Secret Service, the film he turned down. He was offered the part almost immediately, but he took two weeks to finally accept the role. His work on the film Brenda Starr almost prevented him from being able to take the role. Fortunately, the whole Brosnan affair delayed the production and allowed Dalton to finish his work on that film and move on to James Bond. Now this was somewhat of a mess for this guy. Although he was inheriting the biggest role in films, there was this shadow cast on him immediately. So now, not only was he facing the fact that he was inevitably going to be compared to his predecessors, or that film audiences were not that familiar with who he was, but the announcement of him getting the part was somewhat anticlimactic after everyone was anticipating Brosnan as the next Bond. Everyone pretty much already accepted he was going to be the guy. He was the one. The press kept feeding the idea for years and kept up the momentum that fans now expected it. When it didn't happen, there was somewhat of an animosity and indifference to the choice of Dalton. He just seemed like he was a second choice to the guy who was supposed to get it. And Brosnan, by the way, didn't fare too good either. Remington Steel wasn't brought back as a series, but for three two-hour movies in early 1987. The shows were not very good, and Brosnan looked like he didn't even want to be there. A detail the press was more than happy to play up. In his words, the series went out with a whimper. After Steel ended, he starred in a bunch of mainly forgettable movies. Despite not getting the role of 007, he did a series of commercials for Lark Cigarettes in Japan, portraying himself in a Bondian fashion. Ours, as you know, is not a perfect world. May I? That's why it's... During the Super Bowl in 1987, Brosnan appeared in a commercial for Diet Coke in somewhat of a spoof of James Bond. Another commercial aired the following year. Stuff like that further sold his apparent grooming for Bond and would help cement his status as the guy who should have been James Bond to the public. 
When the Living Daylights opened in London in June 1987, Brosnan did not attend the premiere, and didn't even bother making it to the theater to see it. He was on a transatlantic flight months later when it happened to come on. He said he didn't even watch it. But all this stuff is pretty moot now. All the behind the scenes stuff has essentially become a what if game to play and a bunch of trivia. Who shoulda, woulda, couldn't. I do think all this backstory played a part in how Dalton was going to be received as 007 by audiences at the time. But the important thing are the films. They're what count. The films are what we pay to see, they continue the Bond franchise, they hopefully keep longtime fans happy and recruit new ones to the series. And if the films are any good, they'll continue to be watched and enjoyed years later. So, how did Dalton do?